once during the series of debates in Illinois that would make Abraham Lincoln famous, he displayed his characteristic humor. His debating opponent, Senator Stephen Douglas, accused Lincoln of being two-faced. Lincoln replied, I leave it to my audience. If I had two faces, would I be wearing this one? Throughout his presidency, which would be one of the most stressful in history, Lincoln continued to make jokes and to see the humor in things. It was a way for him of relieving anxiety. Franklin Roosevelt had a different method of relieving anxiety. Because of his polio, Roosevelt was unable to relax in the way that some of us might, playing golf or taking long walks. He liked to settle down to a game of poker, particularly seven-card stud. Among the regulars he would play with, Vice President, Speaker of the House, Attorney General, Secretary of Commerce, and sometimes a Supreme Court Justice or two. The President's Secretary, Missy Lee Hand, served cocktails and often played in the game as well. One of the rules was that nobody could discuss anything serious at his poker games. If these presidents were good at handling their own personal anxiety, perhaps it was because, in both cases, they had been elected to deal with the nation's anxiety in the midst of great crises. Anxiety. If it's something you don't like, then you are not unlike most American voters, now or in history. There have been so many periods in history where there's been anxiety. During the French Revolution, and fear of attack in America. In the credit crunch of 1819, when James Monroe was president. During the Civil War, the Great Depression, the post-World War I recession and social strife, the 60s, the gas crisis and lines of the 1970s. Well, it's not easy to make universal statements about all of these periods. One thing's clear, they can be razor sharp, these events slaying candidates, parties, house majorities, presidents, plans of parties to dominate forever and realign American politics, sliced open by these periods of anxiety. Of all of these crises, there are two that top the rest. Because in both these cases, undoubtedly the nation was in peril. Everything could have unraveled. And although the nation was saved from them, America did not remain unchanged in either case. The two events I refer to are the Civil War and the Great Depression. There are other times of anxiety, to be sure, but these two are unsurpassed in that it wasn't clear if the nation would even survive during these periods. Two presidents emerged in the middle of these crises, and they became legendary presidents. Franklin Roosevelt, thought to be a scheming doppelganger, an inferior democratic version of his Republican cousin. He thrived and brought presidential power to new heights. Abraham Lincoln entered the White House in 1861, not the favorite of many in even his own Republican Party. He took office as parts of the Union had unraveled, had left the country, and it's worse than it even seems when we read it in the pages of history textbooks. Yes, it's true that South Carolina and other southern states had seceded from the Union. But you also had border states on the fence. Would they join the Confederacy? Would they not? States like Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland. New York City was talking about becoming a free city, not aligned to either the Union or the Confederacy. And western states were thinking maybe they should secede too. Add a prime minister in England salivating over the prospect of, of splitting his American rivals and a scheming Louis Napoleon III in France who would have loved to find a way to help the Confederacy if at all possible. And you have the quintessential recipe for disaster. But Lincoln held the border states, led his armies, found the right general, eventually won the war, and earned his spot on Mount Rushmore. In both cases, the presidents who acted boldly in the crisis gave their party the keys to the White House for a long time. Once handed those keys, in 1859, the new Republican Party would not give the White House up until 1885. Once Republicans coughed it up in 1933, 
they would not see the West Wing again until 1953. In each case, crisis allowed parties to do more than just win. They put a hurt on the incumbent party, one that took a long time to recover from. That has to be good news for already joyous Democrats. They may have won here more than an election, which would be a happy event in and of itself, as Dems have lost the last two. But are we really in such a crisis? Of course, great big crises suffer from a dearth of examples. There's really just the two that I could isolate. Even though World War II and the rise of Hitler was a crisis, it did not have the utter gripping fear and chance of disillusion of the country itself that the Great Depression or Civil War had. The feeling that the nation could be finished, it could be all over. There's no trend to clearly point to that President Obama would enjoy success. But there seems to be some circumstantial evidence. Are we now entering one of those crises where the nation is absolutely afraid, where it seems like things could go any way at all? It's hard to say. Most experts see a devastating recession. We're likely already in one. The stock market has tumbled to under eight at the time of recording. Is that the Great Depression? Not yet, it seems. And there's two differences apparent with what's going on now in the Great Depression. One that I see is the prevention of total bank panic. That separates this from the Great Depression and most 19th century panics. The other is the existence of certain stimulative forces in our economy. Pensions, Social Security, millions of government jobs that didn't exist in the past, military spending, uh, even in time of peace. And we have a better basic structural economy than in 1929. That doesn't mean we won't see hard times. These payments and infusions of cash into the economy are not enough to produce a boom. It may not meet the crisis of a great nature. Those that surely re-elected, the problem solvers who were elected to fix them. So it's hard to put this crisis in the top of the pyramid of American crises, if you will. But there must be another level down. Did Kennedy get elected in 1960 in the midst of a great crisis? No, it wasn't the Civil War. But you could say it was a time of high anxiety. Sputnik, U-2, Increased Soviet steel production, increasing third world influence, Cuba. The Soviets were on a roll. They were making progress and playing tough with the United States. Sputnik, and an object that the Soviets put in space that was circling the Earth, scared Americans. Kennedy's bold space program sought to gain ground on the Soviets. The public supported it and the cost that it took. It is likely that John F. Kennedy would have beat his friend, Barry Goldwater, in the election of 1964 had he lived. In fact, the two spoke about the prospect before Kennedy died. But while he was chummy with Goldwater at times, he didn't respect him. No brains, he said about Goldwater, affectionately. Kennedy's handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis guaranteed his re-election, were denied to know the result of such an election by the tragic events of 1963. Lyndon Johnson had no problem earning re-election as a Democratic president. Of course, there was tremendous sympathy for the previous occupant of the office. We must also assume that some of that was goodwill for the performance of the Kennedy administration. Another period of anxiety, if not actual crisis, was the 1980 hostage crisis. In addition to rampant inflation and unemployment during the tail end of President Carter's term, while the Iran hostage crisis didn't threaten our security per se, but a foreign nation had invaded our embassy and affect our soil, and the occupants, Americans, were harmed. ABC's Nightline counted the days that Americans were in captivity. It was a bad moment for American prestige, and it hurt. President Jimmy Carter, bad. As Ronald Reagan prepared to take the oath of office, President Jimmy Carter spent the morning, as he had spent most of the waning days of his presidency, trying to negotiate release of the hostages. The Iranians released the hostages only as Reagan was taking office. According to many of President Reagan's 
former advisors. He was disgusted at the thought that any American president, even the rival that he had just beaten, could be treated that way. He asked the now former President Carter to meet the hostages in Germany. But nonetheless, Reagan benefited greatly from the image of the hostages being released as he was taking office. In effect, he had an early significant foreign policy success, which gave him crucial momentum in both his foreign and domestic policy pursuits. Although Reagan would encounter some fiscal problems in the middle of his first term, he was easily reelected. As Bill Clinton took office in 1993, then as in now, there was some question as to what to do about the economy. Some advisors urged caution, pay down the debt. Others urged to spend and invest and infuse cash into the economy. Clinton picked both. But since the spending was in a stimulus bill that could be filibustered, the Senate can filibuster anything that's not included in a budget, his rival Bob Dole made his choices easy. Only the deficit cut, which also included an increase in the top tax bracket in America, uh, would go through. By May of 1993, gross national product had only increased an anemic 0.7%. Still positive growth, and a recession means two quarters of negative growth, but not very positive growth. Advisors said that meant trouble. But soon in the first term of the Clinton presidency, the economy reversed, and Clinton looked better than the man he had replaced during a period of economic anxiety. As a candidate, Dwight Eisenhower said, I will go to Korea. The phrase may have won him the election and re-election at the same time. The nation was upset about the Korean War. Uh, It seemed to be dragging on the spread of war, possibly, with China and the Soviet Union. And they were upset about domestic economy and the hyperbole about communist infiltration of the Truman administration that they kept hearing. And so when Eisenhower did go to Korea, when the Korean War was ended, 1956 seemed quite better by comparison. And American voters re-elected Eisenhower. Prior to Bill Clinton, William McKinley was the president remembered for the period of economic boom in America after the disaster of 1893. He was associated with the nation's prosperity and easily re-elected in 1900. And he was greatly mourned in 1901 when he was assassinated, an event that many Americans thought would send the nation into depression. The Cuban Missile Crisis and the Soviet juggernaut in the early 1960s, the Panic of 1893, the Hostage Crisis of 1980, The Korean War, the 1991 recession, were times of anxiety, not as great as the Depression or the Civil War. And thus, in my belief, they did not guarantee re-election to the occupants of the office at the time, such as a great crisis would. Reagan would suffer through a 1982 recession and would lose House seats. McKinley would have to, although he had improved the economy, Most Americans liked him for that. He would have to deal with the thorny issue of internationalism and imperialism. Bill Clinton was seen as a sure bet to lose the presidency after the House midterms of 1994, loss of the House. And many of the presidents who held the White House during these periods of anxiety in America would lose the House in midterms. They weren't all successful. The period of anxiety didn't guarantee them much in the world of politics. Yet taking over in a crisis seems to have given them a boost for their own re-elections, and it was tough to get the White House from them. In fact, with the caveat that even if we look at the lower pyramid of crises, that there still is a dearth of examples of even these periods of great anxiety. It's really not that often in history. You probably have seven out of the 43 presidencies that began with the president taking over during a crisis. Most have resulted in the party that took over during the crisis winning re-election. The only example I have of a party then going on to not win re-election would be 1844. The Whigs took over during an economic crisis of 1840 from Martin Van Buren, labeled by his opponents as Martin Van Ruin. Not a very popular president. William Henry Harrison took over. 
and the Whig Party was not able to win re-election. Democrats got the White House back. There was a lot of different circumstances. The Whig's president, William Henry Harrison, died in office, and the man who took over, the vice president, John Tyler, was not really in the Whig column, and he had very differing policies from the rest of the party. This created a lot of confusion, especially when he supported the annexation of Texas, as did the Democrats. So you had a Whig president in the White House who wasn't really, in most ways, a Whig. And they did not win the election of uh, 1844. You also had a uh, Liberty Party, which was an anti-slavery party, which uh, hurt the Whig ticket in 1844. And a third party uh, can be a spoiler and a bit of a game changer, and one of the many reasons why any prediction is as good as the paper it's printed on. Still, there is a trend in American history that presidents who take over in a crisis tend to do a bit better. Why is that? Let's examine some of the reasons. And of course, the most obvious one is the simple comparison. Since things were so bad, it could only look better in four years. The economy, the unemployment, and the inflation, the gas lines during Jimmy Carter's presidency, the simple probability was that it would get better in 1984, whether actual policies resulted in that change or not. So was true in 1996 when Bill Clinton was up for re-election versus the recession of 1992. Whether it was happenstance or whether, as Clinton supporters point out, Clinton's aggressive economic policy early in his presidency helped to lower interest rates and led to the boom later, the fact remains that 1996 was probably going to be a better year than 1992 with the recession that existed for about a year and a half at that time. So here, if you look at 2008 and 2012, things are pretty bad right now in 2008. There's tremendous anxiety. There's major banks failing, major Wall Street well-known names collapsing. There's already been several stimulus packages. The uh, GNP doesn't look very good for the fourth quarter. Looks like we've already been in a recession and will probably continue. A simple probability would indicate that unless the United States is going into some emergency, real true emergency situation, things will get better by 2012. One is that these presidents tend to come in with congressional majorities that can help them. If you look at the 1932 election, which Democrats made huge gains, Ronald Reagan's 1980 victory, in which Republicans made gains in the House and took over the Senate. William McKinley's victory in 1896. Republicans took over the House. Partially as a result of this, and also because of the country in crisis, presidents who take over in a crisis tend to get more bipartisan support. So Franklin Roosevelt, for instance, could reach out to Republicans, very progressive Republicans especially, and uh, get some work done. Ronald Reagan was able to reach out to the Bo Weevil or the Yellow Dog uh, conservative Democrats and get his legislation through. Lincoln was able to reach out to border state Democrats who supported the war. These are the types of things that an Obama administration, I'm sure, will hope for. During a time of crisis, press tends to be more favorable. Everyone's looking to the government for a solution, so the president tends to get a little bit better of a honeymoon. For the same reason, the opposition party is shut down a bit. Anything they do seems unpatriotic or uncooperative, as if they're increasing and exacerbating the crisis. No doubt it'll be the same here. There's going to be a lot of confusion among the opposition party as, what do they do? Do they support President Obama's policies, or do they... Uh, vehemently disagree, even when some of the things that a President Obama might implement were started in the late Bush administration. Will the Republican Party that survived the 2008 election throw Bush under the bus and become stalwart conservatives, or will they cooperate? Either of those choices has peril for the opposition party. Anytime I discuss trends, always like to keep things real and point out what might be situations that would change the trend uh, throughout American history. We discussed in 1844 
how a third party movement changed the political dynamics. And that could perhaps happen again. Perhaps by 2012, there could be a stronger Green Party. The Ron Paul movement could rise to service, or there could be a new force that would change the dynamics between the incumbent and opposition party in American politics and not make this trend seem so relevant. Perhaps Republicans could win big in the 2010 midterms, start to change the agenda, and make things not so good for the occupant of the White House. Or perhaps, and I think this would be unlikely, the economic crisis we're in could continue for four more years and not get better. And so Americans would not view favorably the person who won and was supposed to solve their problems. But with a note of these caveats, it's still apparent that there is a trend that American voters tend to like the person that they elected during the period of anxiety. Clotaire Rappé is a marketing consultant, one might say a guru, who has assisted President Clinton, but also assisted major U.S. corporations trying to determine how their customers define their products. He recently said in a book that while every country is different in how voters look at their president, in America, the word that would best describe how Americans view the president is Moses. Americans seem to want a president that comes in and solves problems, that in effect parts the Red Sea. We expect presidents to be better than us. His idea might be a bit far-fetched, but it's not all that far when one thinks about it from what the Constitutional Convention was intending when they argued for a president, those members of the convention that made such an argument. Those that argued for a forceful executive, people like Pierce Butler, delegate from South Carolina, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, James Wilson, talked about how energy and vigor were needed, energy and dispatch, words like this were being used at the convention. The president had to be a single executive, a person who could take control of the country and do what needed to be done in a crisis. Pierce Butler, for instance, talked about how the government in the Netherlands never worked because they couldn't decide on who was the leader. And he gave the example of if a foreign foe had come to do harm to the United States, a president would be able to react in that crisis. The very reason for a president in the system is to deal with crises. Otherwise, other suggestions for how to handle the executive office, such as a council of the presidency, might have worked. But the clear and convincing argument in that convention for the majority of those delegates, not a popular vote, but a majority of those delegates in that room, was that the president needed to be a person who could act in a crisis. This basic vision of the presidency and some of the historical trending is probably cautiously good news for those who support President Obama and the Democrats. And for those who oppose him, well, at least it gives them a little bit of a sense of where they stand and what they and the kind of odds that they're up against. With History of Reading Up Politics, I'm Bruce Carlson. I want to thank you for listening. The website is myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. I'm interested in any questions you might have, suggestions for future topics. I do want to let everyone know that the archive, and that is all or most of the podcasts that we've recorded since the program began in 2006, is going to be available shortly for a very reasonable price. I'm still working out what the model will be, but we'll make that available on the website shortly. It's going to end up being something like 35 to, to 40 hours of podcasts. In the past, I have made that available in different ways. I think at this point, uh, it's become such a large offering. You know, We'll continue to make the most recent 7 to 10 episodes available, either on iTunes or on the website as well. But for going farther in the past, there'll be some fee associated with that. But that is something that'll be coming up soon. The archives will be available.